Good afternoon. Earlier this month, the World Health Organization released new guidelines for providing dental care during the pandemic. According to the WHO, routine dental care such as exams and cleanings should only be provided if the local area has seen transmission rates go from community transition down to cluster cases. Since this announcement, though, many dental groups such as the ADA have issued statements opposing these guidelines. Many dental service organizations have issued similar statements as well. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Mark Cannon of one of those DSOs, the North American Dental Group, about these guidelines and whether or not they're needed in practice today. Dr. Cannon, how are you doing today? I am doing quite well, thank you. And thank you for having me on the program with you. And thank you for joining us today. Um, this has uh, been a very big issue. Um, the pandemic has affected dental practices for months now, and now practices are slowly starting to come back online. And yet these new guidelines are saying, maybe we should slow down once again. So for our audience, can you just sum up what some of the WHO's recommendations have been so far? I absolutely will. And first to explain a little bit about myself, I am a practicing a pediatric dentist. I am part of North American Dental Group. But I'm also a full professor at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. And I am in charge of the research development at Anna Robert Laurie Children's Hospital. And as such, I've been involved in special infectious disease doing research for decades. And so I know a little bit about what the World Health Organization is referring to. I think in first, we have to look at, they titled it as Considerations for the Provision of Essential Oral Health Services in the Context of COVID-19. Note that this is only a guidance, it's not the law by any stretch, and that oral services they consider essential. They listed their concerns as being transmission of the virus via the droplets, aerosols, or contaminated surfaces. These are all things that we have been very much so aware of, and they also mentioned the community rate of infection, and then deferred in their paper to the local community governmental surf, uh, services such as the national subnational, which would be the state and the local levels. So then they recommended safety protocols. So I think it's important to take this in context. Mm -hmm. It's guidance and we are complying with the guidance at this point. Okay. And what are some of the, um, what are some of the more specific details within the WHO's recommendations? Are dental practices currently meeting those standards that the WHO is recommending? Absolutely, and some of these recommendations don't really apply to the United States because they're referring to a worldwide situation and I have lectured in many countries and I have a lot of good friends and colleagues who are in institutions in other countries and they are short of the personal protective equipment. However, here we have responded by following everything that they mentioned in guidelines, we have done the following. We have remote check-in, which they mentioned. We screen the patients and the employees, which they mentioned. In addition, before that, we have actually tested all the employees before they came back. So we do routine testing. of any large case, the patient is tested. We have limited the people in the reception area, which they had discussed. We actually reupholstered all the reception furniture to being a disinfectable surface. Mm -hmm. We have the HEPA filters providing the clean air. We do everything to limit aerosol spray droplets. We've actually been, I think, the first office ever to do surface testing. 20 areas were tested in the office for viral pathogen load, and we were shown to be completely, totally clear. So all the things like the patient screening, remote check-in, all the PPE, we wear the N95 with the level three mask on top, the face shield. These are things that we are doing here in the United States, something that is routine in our office for the protection of the patient, the team, and of course the doctor. And this is something that other countries cannot do. Therefore, I understand the World Health Organization guidance and I understand where they are coming from. Okay, and at your practice and across the NADG as a whole, what were some of the biggest challenges in implementing these new protocols? Well, the first thing is you had to start immediately. And when the offices were closed, I started that day 
working on the day to reopen. Mm -hmm. So that meant procurement of all the HEPA filters, uh, getting everything reupholstered. Actually, we had reversed the flow of the HVAC, put new filters in. We did everything that we had heard was going to be required. So we actually implemented everything early. We were mm -hmm. able to provide emergency care and transitioning immediately to routine care. And probably the biggest challenge was getting all of our team members back, but we did that. And they all feel very secure because they do know we test routinely and we protect them with everything they need. Now, not all offices did that, mm -hmm. but in our situation, we were totally prepared. Okay, and it sounds like these new protocols um, with such a large organization, training is going to be essential and making sure everybody's on board and doing the same thing. How did you implement that kind of training across the company? But the only way you can do that is by online training, of course. That's the only reasonable way, and that's the only way it's available. So by utilizing online training and by just discussions like we're having today, we've got the word out to everyone, and there's been extensive amount of communication between the offices, and I've had people contact me saying, hey, Mark, how did you find this? Where did you find that at? And one of the things is, is just the willingness of all of us to share and the leadership of NADG was very much so backing me on every issue. They told me, get what you need to reopen safely. And that's what I did. Um, one of the big problems that many dental practices have been facing has been PPE supplies. Uh, was that a particular challenge for you? How did you manage that aspect of uh, returning to practice? Well, we've never run out. We have run low at times, but we've never run out. We, again, we're pretty aggressive at looking for supplies. And when I would find supplies, I would tell everyone at NADG where I found the supplies and tell the leadership. And then they would continue from that point. In fact, I went and ordered face shields directly from a, a local manufacturer of them in a huge quantity that lasts all the offices for months. <laughs> and so, I mean, I thought that was kind of funny when they all showed up this giant pallet of face shields. But, you know, you have to uh, sometimes just take responsibility and go ahead and say the most important thing is providing the best possible care, protecting your patients and your, and your team members. And what in the early days of the pandemic, when you were trying to continue to provide that urgent and emergency care, what were the, how were the uh, patients reacting? Were they um, anxious about coming into the office? Were they eager? What was their reaction like? Well, it's so funny you mentioned that. It, it was rather a, kind of a, a funny moment for me because we see a large number of special needs and medically compromised patients. Mm -hmm. They've all come in. And they we they hear the recommendations. We tell them what they have to do: remote check-in, the screening before they get in the office, the limited seating area in the reception area, and then all the special stuff that we have for their protection. They've all said one thing: I am not surprised that this is here. Oh, good. They said we anticipated that. I guess in the way they say, I have this type of fixation. <laughs> <laughs> The way it comes across, I feel like maybe I should seek some counseling for this. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like um, your practice and, and the company as a whole already had um, infection control pretty locked down before the pandemic. So what was that transition like? Well, it's just in, it's enhanced infection control where we are far more cognizant, especially of someone bringing something in like right now. Again, disabled patients, when the wheelchairs come before they can enter the office, we disinfect the wheelchairs, we disinfect them before they leave. That's something we did not do prior to COVID-19. But I think that we're all now aware that was always possibly a source of infection. I did mention the surface testing too that we've done. I think that will be something in the future The offices will go through the surface testing. And by the way, you can't cheat on that. I know the secret behind the surface testing. You have to do it properly. So I think, though, this is all important stuff, but millions of Americans have seen their dentist, and there is yet to be a recorded case of a patient getting COVID-19 from dental treatment. That goes to show 
that dentistry here in the United States responded very well, responsibly mm -hmm. to this issue, this tragic event of COVID-19. I think it's also must be stated mm -hmm. that oral care is essential. And I think you're gonna ask me maybe about why I say that, like, but there's been recent articles published in Medical Hypothesis, the British Dental Journal, showing the essential need of oral health care because periodontal disease is a comorbidity with COVID-19. Can you explain a bit more about the mechanics behind that? Is it related to the inflammation involved with periodontitis and the inflammation that results throughout the body when COVID-19 strikes? Absolutely. In fact, it's kind of funny because I've actually published some articles on this prior about how porphyrmolins gingivalis epigenetically affects all of your epithelial cells, reduces the tight junction so everything can invade. At the same time, it sets off a cascade of inflammation and there's a massive increase of pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's even an increase in capillary growth factor in gingival tissue to increase the blood flow so the bacteria can enter into the systemic circulation. That's why periodontal disease is such a high relationship to death and mortality. But also because it affects your inflammation and causes that, you know, uh, cascade, the cytokine storm that results, and it increases the possibility of pneumonia because it makes you more prone to bacterial infection. So yes, there's been excellent articles published on how this works. And don't forget, pneumonia can live in human plaque. So it's not surprising that really bad oral hygiene contributes to pneumonia and again, uh, the increased mortality with COVID-19. People need to see their dentist. And are you sharing this message about the relationship between oral health and systemic health and particularly COVID-19 with your patients? Absolutely. And in fact, we're sharing it with everyone because I'm a board member of the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. Mm -hmm. We are sharing it with every dentist, every hygienist, and we're encouraging them to do things like log in to these annual meetings where we have world famous experts telling you about the correlation between COVID-19 and periodontal disease. Okay, and how have other things evolved um, over the course of the pandemic over the last few months? How have the protocols evolved? How have some of your treatment evolved? What have the biggest changes been so far? With us, not a whole lot for big changes because we've always had enhanced infection control and we've always used rubber dam. So things like that, I mean, those are routine for us. Uh, everything now is habit. Right now, I can't see us switching back at all because it's now habit it's a habit of me to wear three layers i'm getting used to breathing with three layers on this high altitude training the only issue for many dentists is we all are starting to suffering from tmj from the n95 mask placing pressure on our jaws all day so everyone's complaining about tmdb issues <laughs> <laughs> so do you think many of these changes are going to be permanent and uh, this is the new normal for dentistry even after um, the pandemic is defeated? Well, I think we'll be loosening up on the remote check-in. We'll be loosening up on having the reception chairs limited and assigned seating. I mean, we'll be going back to things like that. But when it comes back to being in the operatory, yeah, I think we'll always be wearing a little bit more personal protective equipment and we'll always be filtering the air and we'll always be worried more about aerosol. I mean, it's a natural progression. Uh, dentistry has been through this before with the HIV AIDS scare, and we recovered beautifully because dentists were responsible. Okay, and, and looking ahead, um, again, as the science keeps changing and as regulations keep changing, what have been some of your key resources where you go for information that you've been sharing with the dentist in your company so that way everybody could be on the same page. Where's the best place to go for, for new information about um, protocols like this? Well, again, I mentioned I'm part of the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. We have a lot of the world's top experts, top physicians. Uh, I've always been involved with special infectious disease groups. And so I get a lot of my information straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, and of course, reading some of the top journals and then again, I've been doing a lot of webinars, sharing the information with uh, everyone I 
can possibly get the information out to. And I mean, just colleagues, I mean, this is one of the things where in a lot of our study clubs, if someone finds a good source of information, they share it with everybody. This is again, what makes dentistry strong is because we've been a good organization, we care about our patients and we share what we know. Okay, great. Well, thank you for um, sharing your time and your expertise with us today. And uh, we'll be in touch as things change in the future. Well, thank you so much. And have a great day. Thanks again. Thank you.